Hello, everybody, and welcome to our end of year branches mothers event. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you, everyone, for joining us on the live stream. There's a Shliach Rabbi Biederman from Vienna, Austria, that shares that he had a mystery. He used to get a donation from the famous psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, and he never really understood why. The mystery was solved when in 1995, a woman in her 80s knocked on, her door, on his door, and he invited her in. Her name was Marguerite Chaius, and she said to him, you're a shliach in Vienna? Actually, I was the Rebbe's emissary, shlucha, before you. So the shliach smiled and waited to hear the story. And she shared that she had had a yechidus with the Rebbe. She was a Holocaust survivor. And she actually poured her heart out and shared her story for the Rebbe. And she mentioned that she wanted to travel back to Vienna. And the Rebbe told her that when you plan a trip, come back to me first. And that's what happened. This woman who planned a trip to Vienna came to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, I have a favor to ask you. And she says, okay. And the Rebbe asked her to go to Viktor Frankl and give over a message. And that's exactly what she did. She actually took her time to locate Viktor Frankl, and she eventually did. And she came to his house and said, I have a message for you from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The Lubavitcher Rebbe told me to tell you that you should not give up. You should keep going and stay strong in your approach. And she described how his entire expression changed. And he was very overwhelmed with emotion. How a rabbi in New York is encouraging him on his path. And the way Rabbi Biederman understands it is that Viktor Frankl, today he's very famous and his book was later translated, Man's Search for Meaning, had an approach that was contrary to what was popular in his field at the time. His approach was meaning-based. His approach was spiritual-based. And they say that he even, you know, even though he was known as a secular Jew, he put on tefillin every day. They found his tefillin afterwards. And Rabbi Biederman shared how in his understanding, the Rebbe wanted the world to hear what the Rebbe always stood for. That when we do things, when we have meaning, when we have a ruchni stick of perspective, when we have a shem in our life, that's the best medicine for a neshama. I can't think of a better person to call up on this topic. As Mrs. Rabashkin comes up, I just want to tell you that you have a coin, a tzedakah, on each of your chairs. We're going to pass around a pushka. Um, Mrs. Rabashkin grew up in Long Island, New York. She actually attended Resurfka, so she's an alumna. She's a mother, grandmother, and most importantly, Rav Shalom Mordechai Rabashkin's devoted wife. Rav Shalom Mordechai operated a giant meat plant, and he was a victim of a libel. And for 10 long and challenging years, Mrs. Rabashkin stood by her husband's side, never giving up Emuna and Betachan. And when it seemed like there was no hope left, we know the miracle that occurred. We asked Mrs. Rabashkin to come speak tonight on this topic, on how we can internalize this idea that a meaning-based life, a Hashem-based life, a Tyra-based and Hasidus-based life is the best thing and the most grounding tools that we can give to our children. This is Rabash again. Thank you so much. Technical difficulties here. Kind of like this. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're here to discuss 
we don't have so much time together, but in the time that we have together, hopefully we can um, explore different ideas and, and bring up different concepts to help us really move forward in our own daily challenges and things that go on in a tyrannical way, in a way that, you know, the Abishta gives us so many opportunities to uh, really grow and, um, and to, to uh, become very resilient ourselves and, and actually give that over to our families. And, um, you know, it's an interesting thing that as mothers, as wives, we have very many different roles and, and different hats that we, that we wear, but it all starts with inside of us. It's all about, okay, how could I grow in my emun and bitachin and Hashem? How could I grow in my resilience and, and, and you know, uh, reach out and reach in to, to really get to where we have to be? And um, really, the, the word resilience really is uh, apropos because it, it connotes bouncing back. It's, it's we're, we're challenged with something, and yet we're strong, and we're able to take whatever it is and to gather that strength and really use it to help us to become better people. And um, we, we, we tend, unfortunately, nowadays with the, the technology, the smartphones, we kind of get snippets and, and clips and sound bites and WhatsApp messages, and we feel that that's going to be our inspiration and that's really going to help us to grow into the people that we really want to be. And, um, you know, we have to realize that these things that we are taking in really mold us and, and, and teach us, you know, uh, how we're going to react to things. And so we have to really be careful what we're, what we're taking in and from who we're taking in because a lot of times that becomes our go-to reaction when we're going through something. And, uh, you know, uh, there's an interesting story that my husband shares from a place called prison where um, he was together with this non-Jewish man who looked very innocent and, you know, like a typical Goisha person. Um, not even, you know, uh, not like the typical inmates maybe. You know, the typical inmate was maybe uh, full of tattoos with the great big muscles and muscular people that are constantly working out. And this guy was more like a meek, Adel looking face or whatever, and he was convicted of murder. And um, he actually had a Yiddish uh, cellmate, and um, there once was a conversation between him, my husband, and his Yiddish cellmate, and they were discussing different things. And actually, this man, besides his regular nine to five job, what worked in the volunteer EMT. Um, section of, of society. He was a volunteer that came to medical emergencies that tried to help lives, and yet he was convicted of murder. And they had this conversation with him once to try to get to the bottom of, like, how is it, like, it doesn't stim, it's, doesn't, the, the, it's not, it doesn't really make sense. How is this? So he, dis, he, he said that actually, you know, he doesn't know himself how he came to do this horrific crime and it was actually a very violent murder nonetheless. And, um, and he said that he got very upset and very jealous and very angry at another person, which, which could have been a, a warranted reaction. And he didn't know how to deal with it. And so what came to his mind was he acted out something that he saw on TV. Meaning that he had ingested something years and years ago and it could be that the setting and the plot of this situation was similar to his life and what had happened to him. And so his reaction and his way of dealing with that was implanted in his brain years and years before. And when it came to him having that situation, that's how he reacted. Now, obviously, that's a very you know, extreme case. Of, of a situation that we typically have in other, you know, m more uh, subtle ways. But the lesson is really clear that when we ingest different things in different, you know, media or different mediums, we are affected by what we're uh, exposing ourselves to. So we really have to be careful and, and really, you know, 
ingest the right things and get, our, get things from the right sources and, you know, and learn how Tyra says to deal with something because, you know, as, as, uh, as we know, good and well, Tyra has an answer for everything and it's just a matter of finding the right person to help you to uncover what Tyra says about this thing or that thing. And, you know, when we were going through our situation, we realized that, yes, we have to do everything we have to do in a, in a, in a Teva Dika way. We have to do, make our Kalim, do our Hishtadlis, however you want to call it. But the bottom line is, is that we understood that as much as we could do this, it's really going to be all Hashem that's really going to help us get to the finish line. So at the same time that we were doing the, the kalim that we were doing, we understood that it's really Hashem that's going to help us. And so we felt that our connection to Hashem was really uh, superseding any kind of, of keli or any kind of hishtadlis that we're going to do because we understood that this was just something that we had to do because Hashem tells us, you don't just sit around waiting for a solution to happen. You have to just do something. You can't just say, okay, you know, I'm waiting in my tent for the month to come on my plate. No, you have to go out and get it. You can't just sit around and, and wait for the chassan to knock on the door. You have to go to a shatkin. There are certain things that you have to do, not because you'll necessarily get the result that you're looking for from that thing, but because that's what Hashem tells us to do tells us to do he expects us to do something and even if we were big tzaddikim and the Abishta would bring a plate of food in front of us to eat we would still have to take a fork and put it in our mouth so no matter what level that we're on, on in our level of bitachim and no matter how much hishtadlos or kalim we want to make in order to get to this finish line it's always HaKadosh Baruch Hu's bracha that gets us what we really need and, you know, when we're going through hard, hard times and, and, and challenges, when we reframe the question and we try to figure out how am I going to raise children who can overcome a Nisayan, instead of trying to figure out how we're going to raise resilient kids, let's look at it because resilience means that we are faced with a trauma, a problem, a situation. But somehow, these different uh, um, terms that we use don't get to the point of what, what is really going on here. What is really going on here is Hashem is putting us in a situation where He wants us to grow. There's no mistakes that happen, and sometimes things are not easy to swallow. Obviously, I, I lived through one of those. It's not, it's not a simple thing. And we sometimes have questions. How could this happen? Why is Hashem doing this? But if we're already putting the, the discussion in the realm of Hashem, if we're already understanding that nothing happens by mistake and everything's happening from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everything is, is based on knowing that Hashem is in control and Hashem is directing my life, then we're able to take it in, in a lot different way. We're able to take it in a way where we're focused on the right, on the right situation. We're focused on where the situation is really coming from. And, um, and I think that, you know, the Pasuk tells us, Adam Amal Yulad, that a person is born to toil. Now, this is very different than what the world wants to teach us, especially in America. We have this, this um, Piskam Achayim, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's very nice for the average American. But for Yiddin, that doesn't really apply. For Yiddin, we're told, and I remember my father, Allah V'Shalom, always telling us this, life is an avayda. Life. And really, you know, we have to really get back to basics. And, and when we're talking to ourselves and we're talking to our children, and really getting them to understand that there's things going on here between our nefesh kiss and our nefesh Bahamas. There's hap things happening you know, that are, that are outwardly good, and there are things happening that's not so good. And when we, you know, understand that even the not so good is from Hashem, you know, we don't believe that there's a good God and a bad God, and, and, and we know 
the story of the Rebbe with the, with the gun, how the officer pulled out the gun and told the, the, the Rebbe Rayat. It could affect people that have many gods and one world, but we only have one God and two worlds. Us because we know that everything's coming in the, from the same place, from the same makar, and that makar is tachlus hatayv. Hakadosh Baruch Hu is the essence of good. Hakadosh Baruch Hu knows our tachlus. He knows where we have to get to, and he helps us to get along both with situations that are beautiful brachas and challenging situations. But it's not a mistake, and it's not something that's meant to punish us. It's meant to awaken us and to, to dig deep inside to see the kaychas that we have. Um, in the Chayvis Lavavis, he brings down a very interesting point, um, which I think is very, very important to mention, especially when we want to get to talking about the resilience of, of children and how to get them to be also very strong and, and able to overcome different challenges in their life. He says that in this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives many different challenges or situations that could be challenging and that a child will experience different childhood diseases, falls, scrapes, situations that are not positive things. You know, as parents, we're always trying to save our children from situations that could be challenging for them. We want to make sure that they're not bullied. We want to make sure that all these things, that they're, that they're safe from all these dangers. And of course, that's our job to do that. But when something happens, when a child comes to us and says, you know, there's a bully on the bus, or this child is busy starting up with him, or when there's different challenges at home, these different things, like Kaddish Baruch Hu puts into our lives to help us to understand that there's taiv and there's ra. There's good and there's evil. And there's, the, it, when we get this when we are children and we understand, you know what? I went outside, it was freezing cold, there was even snow on the ground, but I had short sleeves and I really wanted to jump on the trampoline, so I didn't go, go to get my coat. I ran outside and now I came home. I don't feel well, I have a fever at night and I'm not feeling good. This is all to teach us that there's things that we have to be cautious about. There's things we have to be careful about. There's things that could happen that are not necessarily good things and I have to look out for them. There's things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to teach us what to learn from and there are things that Hashem wants to teach us what not to do, what not to learn from. And when we understand the world in that way, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, in, in this crazy liberal world that we live in, there's no good and there's no bad because we have to understand the other person and they're choosing to, to have a, a, a be terrorists because they're underprivileged or whatever the, the, the excuse is. No, in Taira, there is good and there is bad. And we have to see that for what it is. And when we see that for what it is and we could use different opportunities throughout our day and it doesn't have to be you know, a major, uh, 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 you know, uh, lesson or, or they don't have to feel like they're being, you know, what spoken to and, 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 you know, like a whole share that we're giving them. It could be just a little interaction around the table. Our reactions and our, and our uh, um, decisions and our choices that we make, all the little subtle things that we do throughout our time raising our children these are the small droplets that drop into his neshama to, to make him understand what this world is all about. If we are not resilient ourselves, if we fall apart at every single little thing that happens because we're not viewing it in a tyradika way, so then it's impossible for us to give over to our kids what we really want to give over to them. So it's like we see, we hear on the plane, every time we board a plane and the, the stewardess gets on and goes through the whole safety rules and she says, uh, secure your seatbelt or secure, or secure your oxygen before you help anybody else. This is the same thing with the different um, health issues that we're talking about tonight, the emotional health issues that we're talking about. We have to help give ourselves that resilience. We have to help ourselves 
learn what does it mean to, to be a Torah Dikayid when such a thing goes on. And when we give that to ourselves, then it automatically bubbles down to our environment, whether it's our home environment, whether it's our work environment, our, we, our, 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 our maizim, our, our dibor, our machshava, it's all in there. It all gets affected as time goes by. And sometimes people have an easier uh, um, way with first putting it into their head, and then they start actually talking that way, and then they actually start working that way and dealing that way, and their maizim become like that. Some people, it's the opposite. Some people, by, in their maizim, it's very easy to go through the motions. It's very easy to do lip service and talk that talk. But our machshava is very hard. So each person um, really has to go according to the way that they go. <laughs> and, um, and, and really, you know, that's, that's their, their method, you know. Uh, but the, the point is, is that when we strengthen ourselves, then we could in turn strengthen our kids because they're living in that environment and we're able to take different situations and make them into chinuch opportunities without it being a whole, you know, class on bitachain, on understanding that Hashem is, is running the world, whatever the situation of being, you know, uh, kids that share, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. But when we get that resilience within ourselves, then we are able to give it over to their kids. And this is something that, that really, you know, brings things into... Uh, a very practical way. Basically, what we're saying is we want to bring Hashem into the picture. Whatever we're going through, whatever negative feeling we might be having, you know, whatever issues we're doing, you know, it's funny, we call it mental health, but really it's emotional health. Really, it's health that is involving the heart. It's really not in the head. Although, Bar Hashem and Hasidus, we learn, but really this feeling that we're feeling or the these, these, these things that we want to try to resolve or, or work through are really feelings. And we do that by really understanding ourselves and what Tyra has to say about those different emotions, anxiety, you know, a lot of things, that it's, it's, it's about the future, right? What's the future going to bring? Well, really, it's really turning to Hashem for the future because Hashem is really the one that's, you know, bitachain is a midah, it's a mitzvah that has to do with the future. It's about Emuna is, is, is that mitzvah for the past of knowing Gamzula Teva, that whatever happened was meant to be. We're being Mechabal Ba'ava. We understand that whatever happened, like my husband says, is the best thing that could have happened to me, even though it doesn't look too great right now. And Bitachain is that mitzvah of moving forward into the future, of understanding that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Abishta, wants us to ask for what the, Eib what the Rebbe always used to coin, Teva Nirva Hanigla, revealed good. We don't have to be satisfied with what happened yesterday if it wasn't the good that we could see. We could daven and, 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 and really beg HaKadosh Baruch Hu, beg Hashem to make it a good that we could see. But what the more that we could bring in Hashem into our lives and into our children's lives and our reactions to be around that, the, the, the stronger they'll be, the stronger we'll be, and the more success we'll find in resolving these situations. So I want to share two stories with you. One from a place called Freedom. One second here. One from a place called Freedom, which happened a couple of years ago. Very interesting story. We often tell stories about uh, from a place called Prison. And I constantly um, ask my husband and I myself like to share stories from a place called Freedom because Baruch Hashem, most of us are not in a place called prison, although sometimes we have nasianas that make us feel like we're in a prison. But, you know, we're living, we're, go, we're, 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 we're uh, walking and, and talking, and we're, we're busy, involved with in, in, a, in a place called Gullus, which is really a place called prison, but uh, whatever, we're, we're, we're in a place called freedom officially. And there are many things to learn. And when we open our eyes and we see what's going on around us, and we understand, like the Baal Shem Tov told us, that everything we see and we hear is really meant to give us a lesson in the Vedas Hashem, then we could really understand the world in a different, in the, in a different way. So my, we had a very interesting experience a couple of years ago on Simchas Teira. It was in a place called Freedom, Baruch Hashem. We were in Jackson, New Jersey, where we live for that, that Yantif. Now that we're uh, 
Baruch Hashem, out in the in the uh, in the forefront. We are not, you know, privileged to be in 770 for Simchas Torah, and uh, so we were in Jackson, and it was a beautiful yuntiv. Everything was very nice, and we have our little shul there, and it was really packed. It was beautiful with a lot of guests, and of course, the candy man was on steroids uh, for Simchas Torah, and the candy was flying all over the place. I have a little anakal. His name is Mishulam. And he's five years old, and he is dodging and, and slipping across the floor and grabbing this candy and that candy. And by the end of the day, he had this sack of candy that was full to the brim. And of course, he was very quick, but not all the kids were very quick. And so everybody, all the kids were coming over to him. Oh, Mishalom, can I have this? Can I have that? Baruch Hashem, he, he shared for quite a while. And then, all of a sudden, I see him coming, running to my daughter, crying. I don't want to share anymore. I gave so many candies away. It's not fair. She already got one. Why does she want another one? All kinds of complaints that he had. And um, the truth is, he kind of like, you know, hogged all the candies because he was so quick. And he didn't, you know, think about letting, you know, being a little slow and letting the other kid get something. And he did have this very big sack of candies, and he did share. But now he's coming, and he's, he's tired. He doesn't want to share anymore. But, you know, my daughter felt like, what do you mean? You know, we have plenty of candy at home. You could share now. It's not a big deal. Even if you get to the bottom of the sack, it's, not, it's okay. You're, you're going to have candies. Don't worry about it. So she tried to reason with him and explain to him that really, you know, it's, it's fine, you know, you'll, you'll get more candy at home. And, 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 and anyway, you know, the taste of the candy is for a minute. But if you share, then you're doing a mitzvah. You're doing what Hashem wants you to do. And he, so she, she reiterated that, that, that point. And she said, you know, the candy, you're going to lick that lollipop. And probably your tongue will stay red longer than you'll have the taste in your mouth. But that'll be it. That'll be the end. Your enjoyment will be over. But if you share, that's a mitzvah, and a mitzvah is forever. She planted that little seed. The next Shabbos, she hosted Mesiba Shabbos, and at the end of Mesiba Shabbos, they were dancing, uh, you know, they were, they were jumping on the trampoline, and everybody was very excited, and there were three kids left on the trampoline. S two siblings, and my grandson, Mishalom, and the two mothers, my daughter and the, the mother of these two kids, were standing on the side chatting, and my daughter overhears this conversation. And basically, it was a repeat. The older sibling had a bunch of candies, and the younger sibling wanted something. And my grandson, Mishalom, like had sat down on the side of the trampoline after jumping like endlessly for 15 minutes. And he's sitting down, and he hears the two siblings fighting. And he says to this older, older son, this friend, he says, Shmulki, you should really share. You know why? Sharing is a mitzvah, and the mitzvah is forever. And my daughter was like blown away that she was zeichet to even hear this conversation because who would think that a random little, I mean, it's not like she delved on it. It's not like she kept repeating it and reinforcing it again and again. It was like a one-time thing. But when a, a kid can grow up in an environment where there are constantly chinuch moments, it seeps in, it gets in, and it teaches them to be resilient. It teaches them to go in the ways of Hashem, and it's really a very special thing. I'm going to share one more story before my time is going to be up, but this is a story from a place called prison, and um, it was a very interesting situation. We were in the visiting room, and the visiting room is probably the size of this area here, and it was with chairs and tables, and everybody sits you know, with their inmate, with the person they're coming to visit. And we're sitting there one, one Friday, and it's very hot. It was probably the similar season to now, where it's like almost the summer, but not quite the summer, where the kids are still in school, and, but it's very, getting very hot. And in a place called prison, they do not have air condition. And actually, the, the visiting room had a couple of fans that blew hot air around, besides the dust that came off the blades of the fan, it tried to blow the hot air around, and it was very uncomfortable those warm uh, summer days or beginning of the summer days, and it was a very hot day that day, and my son, Uziel, was very hot. And so we bought him, you know, a, a water, and we bought him chips, and we bought him more water, but he was very, very hot. 
And he kept saying to my husband, I can't take it. I'm so hot. I'm so hot. I can't take it. Anyways, in this facility, we were Zaifa to have kosher vending machines. And they had these vending machines that sold kosher meals. And they also had a, co a vending machine that sold ice cream. And Mr. Klein from Klein's Ice Cream was a visitor that used to come as Mitzayim, as his is Chesed. And he used to come and, and, um, and visit with just random Yiddish people that had nobody else visiting. It was very, very special. And he mentioned to us that he is going to arrange to get Chol Yisrael ice cream in the vending machine so that the kids should have something to, to eat when it gets hot. Meanwhile, my son Uziel was very hot. And this story happened a couple of weeks ago, and he was sure that there was kosher vi uh, ice cream in the vending machine. But my husband said, I don't think there's any kosher ice cream yet, but, you know, maybe mommy could take you to the vending machine and you could go check. So he went to check, and it didn't seem like there was any ice cream there. And we sat down, and about 10 minutes later, a more modern Yiddish mensch came in, and he's coming to visit a friend of his. And um, he sits down, and he gives, he gives the, the guards the papers. He sits down, and he's waiting for the inmate to come. And he decides he's going to go to the vending machines and buy stuff for his, his friend. So he goes straight to the ice cream machine, and he buys ice cream. And he sits down, and my son starts yanking my, my husband on the sleeve. And he says to him, Ta, look, they brought ice cream. And my husband looks over to where the, this man was sitting, and it turned out that it was Blue Bunny. It was chal of stam, it was chal of akum. And so, of course, we don't eat that. And so my husband said, I'm sorry, Uziel, we don't eat that ice cream. It's not our, uh, our hechsher. So, um, so he started just getting, really, the Yetzirah was like harassing him. I can't take it anymore. I must have ice cream. I just, I can't anymore. I'm so hot. Uziel, you just had two drinks of water. How could you be so, I uh, no, I'm so hot. It's so hot here. I can't take it. So my husband starts reasoning with him that he has to calm down because they're going to kick us out. And, and, and it's fine. I'm, we're going to leave soon, and you're going to be able to, to get what you're, what you're missing. You're going to get all the ice cream. He can't handle it. He's just The logic situation was not going anywhere. We want Mashiach now? I want ice cream now. Anyways, he's a seven-year-old kid. There's no, not too much reasoning with him. So my husband knowing the different techniques that, you know, we learn as parents. So he reasoned with him. That didn't work. So now he's going to try, um, he's going to try to give him an incentive, otherwise known as bribery. So he starts telling him, you know, Ziel, mommy's going to take you out, and you're going to get three ice creams. But he can't. He's just too hot, and he's too upset, and he can't take it, and he wants ice cream now. Three ice creams, four ice creams. My husband went all the way up to 10 ice creams. Mommy's going to take you out. You're going to get 10 ice creams. But he could not calm down. And meanwhile, the guards are calling him over. Vashkin, you don't get this kid quiet, and you're leaving. And we're sending your wife and kids home, and you're going back to the cell. My husband was very anxious about that. He didn't really want to go back. He, every minute in the visiting room was like oxygen for him. And so he, he said, please, Uziel, calm down. So he calmed down for another three minutes, but he just could not, he, can't, he couldn't do it. So my husband thought to himself, and he said, listen, there are so many times that I'm inside that place, and I have to reason with myself to get myself to do the right thing or to, to whatever it is. How do I end up doing it? How do I end up reaching inside deep in myself and reaching out to get the kaychas that I need to do it? I have to reason with my neshama. I have to, I have to connect to Hashem and what he wants from me. So my husband made an experiment. He said, you know, Uziel, you have two choices here. You could either eat the ice cream, you could get the ice cream now, and then you'll be happy, but Hashem won't be happy. Or you could wait, and then you'll be happy, and Hashem will be happy. So what do you want to do? And we watch this little kid as he's trying to process what my husband said. And... Um, he just, all of a sudden, it clicked in his head what was going on, and he absolutely changed the subject altogether. He said, you know, my Rebbe's taking us on a trip next week, and I'm so excited, we're going on a bus, and he starts going into this whole trip. And it was astounding to us what 10 ice creams couldn't do, what reasoning and trying to, to work with his seichel couldn't do, knowing that he was making Hashem happy, tapping into what Hashem wanted from him, at the age of seven, how many times do we go through situations where we think our children are too immature to get this concept, 
we can't really bog them down with this kind of achrayis. Whatever the Yetzirah wants to feed into us to make us feel like this is the wrong approach, this is always the right approach. When we could connect Hashem to these different situations, we could never lose. Obviously, we don't want to, like, give lectures and be what... But when we raise children like this, when we find this method working for ourselves in our own lives and we incorporate it into our family life, then it works. And it's really unbelievable. And I, I challenge you, everybody, to try this because you're going to see, you will be shocked at your children's reactions and how that you'll really be infusing your homes with this emun and bitachain, which th with this connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and, and really, like, raise the level, ra raise the bar of your family to have emotional health that you will really be very surprised at. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Mrs. Raboshkin. I think that was my favorite story in the book, and I can attest that after I read it and I tried it when I was, like, at my wit's end with a kid or two, um, I indeed found that it was the most powerful when we could activate the real identity of a child, the source, get them into their neshama space. So thank you so much, Mrs. Raboshkin, and thank you also for empowering us to have conversations with our children, to talk to them about our values, about what, we, what works for us, about seeing through every challenge as an assign, as a test, as an opportunity, as almost like, you know, in a game, you go to the next rung, like, you know, let's overcome it. Like, you have the power. Um, I'd like to introduce, for a few minutes, um, a woman who has been helpful to us already for a few years, Mrs. Rahama Bistritsky klatman She's the founder, the executive director of MASK. She's in her 26th year since she founded it, has helped over 120,000 families. And we're grateful for her helping us with sponsoring the evening. Good evening, and thank you very much to branches, all the staff, the volunteers that work so hard uh, for inviting Mass to collaborate with you. Uh, it's a, really an honor. Uh, Mass is Mothers and Fathers Aligned Saving Kids, kids of all ages and all stages for all mental health struggles, including addiction. We offer parent support groups by Zoom. Um, you can just call the MASK office and register. We have a helpline. We are a referral agency for therapists, inpatient, outpatient programs around the world. And um, we are giving out a book tonight, uh, uh, Me and Uncle Baruch, A Story of Families Coping with Mental Health Issues. Our goal is to get these books read to the young children so that they start, we, we start to have them understand mental illness, mental struggles, working towards stigma free. I want to thank you again. Good night. Thanks, Rahama. If you notice the words on their flyer, our next presenter, it said, what parents could do so they don't land up in the therapist's office. <laughs> now, obviously, everything's in the hands of Hashem, and different people will have different challenges. But we all want to know as mothers, what can we do to be the most effective? What can we do to give our children practical um, tips? How can we do the best that we can when we are raising our children so that they have whatever tools that they need? Rabbi Shputz, I'm going to start with the fact that he teaches in Beis Rivka, um, and the girls gain a tremendous amount from the seminary, from his vast knowledge and experience, and all of his qualifications. He's an LMHC in the state of New York. He's a practicing therapist. Um, he specializes in treating anxiety and behavioral disorders. He has taught elementary school children for two decades. He was actually honored with the Grass Life Teachers Award for Teaching Excellence. 
and he has a private practice in Brooklyn. He gives evaluations, trainings. He's coming to speak tonight. Um, he's also the clinical instructor, uh, clinical instructor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the NYU School of Medicine. He has been on the crisis intervention team. The truth is the list goes on and on, um, but you'll hear for yourselves. Thank you, Rabbi Shbutz, for taking your time to talk to the Beis Rebka mothers. title in the flyer was how to prevent children and teens landing in my office. And I think the very first thing we want to do is tefillah. There's a Sefer Hasidim from Yehuda Chafed, one of the Rishonim, Says Adam If a person asks, Shehu His request is something that is Shaykhis with Hashem. You're asking something that is Nageya to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. V'shoifech es nafshoi Olav. When he pours his heart out. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shoimeya Tfilah Soi. HaKadosh Baruch Hu listens to his Tfilah Afal Pi She'ein B'Yodoi Maisem Toivim. Although we may not deserve it, but when we ask Hashem for our children, HaKadosh Baruch Hu listens. Tie the mothers and fathers. Pause. And think of your one child that you worry mostly about. And say a tefillah, Ona Hashem Hashiyana, Ona Hashem Atzlichana. Rabbi Shalom, help us. We don't know always what the right answer is. Therapists and professionals also don't have all the answers. What I want to share with you tonight is what I do in my office. What we do in our offices, we parents can do with our children. When we meet our pediatrician, and he listens carefully to the chest of this little child in his office, we watch a doctor listen attentively. Have you ever noticed what his nonverbal communication looks like? Where his eyes are focused, where his kavana and mind is connected. How do we listen attentively to a child, to a teenager that comes home from school? Ma, I'm not going back tomorrow. My Rebbe is ridiculous. I'm done. The seventh grader that comes home and says, everyone was invited besides me. What do you do when Moshe Rabbeinu finished the entire Torah, he said to the Eden, Simu levavchem lechol hadvodim. You learned now tayag mitzvahs. Now I have one thing that I ask you, Eden, to do. Put your heart to it. We all have the largest part in our heart we have for our children. What does it mean, put my heart to my child? Look at Rashi, what Rashi says. Simu says Rashi, Tzorich Adam, 
שיהיו עיניו, his eyes, ואוזניו, and his ears, וליבוי, and his heart, מכוון להבן. Putting your heart means my eye contact is to my child. I'm listening attentively and I'm opening my heart to the experience. How powerful is eye contact? There's a famous study that was done how much children connect through eye contact. When a parent, when a child walks in to the house and that parent establishes and maintains eye contact to that conversation, it can sometimes be overwhelming. It establishes a deeper emotional connection. Remaining eye contact to the child helps us stay present and it helps us read the emotion. One of the things We saw in COVID was that smiles are not on the face only, not only on the mouth, smiles are in the eyes. When our faces were covered, we saw emotions in the eyes. In the following video, you'll see what it looks like the face recognition from a child to a parent. And look how frustrated the child gets when you stop paying that attention. You have it? we've learned over the years is that babies are much more capable than we initially imagined, but they're also much more vulnerable. And in Edtronic's still face experiment, we get to see both in a very short period. We see the baby and the dad playing together in their routines. There are things that they know about each other and things that they do together and it's fun. And then we ask the dad to turn away, and when he turns back, to keep his face completely still and not respond to the baby. And the results are almost immediate, and they're devastating. The baby looks to the dad and tries to get the dad to get back into those games. Hey, we were just playing just a minute ago, weren't we? We were having fun, what's going on? And then the baby starts to get frustrated when that doesn't work. So she'll have to look away and look around the room and find something else and then look back and say, now can we play? And within three minutes, the baby has really dissolved. <laughs> She is trying to get out of the chair. She's uncomfortable. She's reaching out to dad. She's crying. And then we ask the dad to turn away again. And when he turns back, to go back to being regular dad. And it's a joyous reunion. They get back into their routines, the things that they do together, the things that they were just doing three minutes before. And the baby settles down and gets back to the comfort zone that she's developed with the dad. What we see in the still face experiment is how able the child is to initiate and be part of the relationship between the father and the child. 
but also how much she depends on that relationship in order to keep an even keel. And when she's grounded and comfortable, she can explore the world, she can meet new people, Hola. she can try new things, and she's got that safe base that she can always rely on. And there's a trust level there. We can only begin to imagine what it's like for babies whose life is like that three minutes all of the time. And they don't get that responsiveness and they don't get any help getting back to an even keel. And the results can be very tragic. They can have trouble trusting people. They can have trouble relating to people and they can have trouble being calm enough so that they can explore the world and take part in the world. So we know that those initial relationships, that initial responsiveness and interaction between the father and the baby are keys to the baby's success as a child and as an adult. see me saying next. I'm sorry you didn't see the previous uh, slides. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Maybe you can help her. The slides as I'm talking, you see me saying the next thing. Thank you. Move to the next. And Simon Yud Zion, there is a halacha that can help us understand how to attend and listen to a child. When two people have a dentire and they come down to Basin and they have an argument, Moshe says, You owe me $100,000, and Yaakov says, Never. There is a halacha. There's a lacha that based in may never cut short anyone talking. Based in is not allowed to say, okay, just tell me what you mean. Why? Because when you tell someone, just get to the point, they lost their ability to concentrate and express. Allow your child to finish speaking before sharing your thoughts and ideas, which can, which can sometimes be really difficult. Imagine your daughter comes home and she says, my teacher is not normal. Well, the very first thing you want to say is, what did you do? Or don't speak like that. To hold that off, and pause and ask what happened. And when she goes on and she says, well, she picks up me. And you're about to say, she doesn't do that. You know, for no, for no reason. Just ask, and what happened? When we listen attentively, we ask again and again and again the same question, and what happened? If you allow a child to express gradually, the entire story will unfold, even the part that she has to own. What do our minds do automatically? Try this. Mary had a little. And your mind says it immediately. It's not Hanukkah. You're not in the middle of kindergarten. All I said was half of a sentence. And I paused. And you just automatically finished it. That's what our minds do. When our child comes home. And they're frustrated. Our mind shatters and wants us to interrupt. And watch what happens. 
There are two wheels in our brain that turn. One is called the judging wheel, and the other one is the solving wheel. The judging wheel is you always get in trouble. Well, Ruchi didn't have these issues. The solving wheel is just go over to your teacher and talk to her. Or tomorrow, just go over to your friends and be part of the game. And when we do that, which is our instinct to do, we did what the Shechon says we shouldn't do because it's not effective. We cut them off. So as parents, when children express to us, what we need to do is put ourselves in the pediatrician's shoe in both ears, just attentively listening. And when you see or you feel your urges coming up where you just want to say it, hold off. And if you said it, take it back. Tell your child, I'm sorry, I want to first listen, finish listening to you. In order to do that, one of the very simple things we can do as human beings is take a gentle breath. In through your nose, out through your mouth, and pause. There's a very powerful word from the Baron Kaliner. He says, Ki rega our minds race either to the future, what's going to be with this child, how is she going to get married, or to the past, what did she do yesterday? It's difficult to be in the present moment when a child talks to us. The same applies when we serve Hashem. It's hard to start davening when our mind races. But when we want to be ki rega. If we can be in that moment, then chayim b'tzaynai, we can live with Hashem's ratzayin. What's the ba'apoy? I want to show you what I do in my office. You can all teach this to young kids. As young as four and five years old. When I very, the beginning when I learned the power of slowing down and being in the moment, one of the things we know we help people with anxiety, panic, even anger, is we teach them deep breathing. To young kids, teaching deep breathing can be a challenge. But one of the things we can do is teach them just to take a little basamim, and make a boy mina besamim, make the bracha, and take a, take a deep smell in. That's an automatic deep breath. And when we blow out, we can just use a little bubbles. And I can have kids as young as six years old who use the technique of deep breathing. The Rebbe writes that we want to model to our children. What they want to do is something we want to model. By if I bring in the Rebbe said, the first thing, a parent or any mechanic wants to show a live example. The Rebbe writes, when a child sees that a person that's there for him applies that skill then they themselves use it. Can you imagine if you see yourself being overwhelmed when your child is overwhelmed? Take a deep breath. You end up modeling to your child how to slow down when our emotions are active and overwhelming. The other thing that the Shulchan Aruch Paskins and Hilchas Dayanim is in Siv Zion 
Tzadich Hadayin L'shmoya Divrei HaBaladinim Ulushana Yisai Sam. It's a fascinating halacha. Moshe comes into Beisdin and says, Yaakov owes me a thousand dollars. And Yaakov says, no. Beisdin has a halacha to repeat what Moshe said and what Yaakov said. Moshe, the Beisdin says, Moshe, you claim Yaakov owes you a thousand dollars. Yaakov, you deny it. The Mepharshim asks, what's the halacha? You just heard. Yes, but the Baldin, the person who's being judged, needs to feel and hear and understand that you heard him. And that only happens when you paraphrase. When a child comes home and says, I was kicked out of class, I was in trouble, and it's not my fault, that's the beginning of his story. And you ask, what happened? And then what happened? But you want to paraphrase. You want to repeat to this child what he says so you can get it clear. But a higher level of that and maybe more a simple level of that can be reflecting a feeling to a child. As parents, it's extremely difficult to watch children in pain. It's extremely children struggling emotionally, behaviorally, socially, academically. When we watch children in pain, we jump in to save them. That's what Atzala does. We parents feel like we're on call. When our child comes home and he says something happened, we want to jump in and solve and remove that pain. The challenge is that solving emotional pain is not a practical intervention where you tell the child, go back to school tomorrow and just make it work. Help, helping children emotionally happens by being there for them, by attending and listening. Imagine how would it look like to you if the pediatrician is listening to your son's or daughter's heart rate when you're concerned about our breathing, but on the other hand, he's holding his cell phone and chatting. You would probably never see that pediatrician again. And then the child would have that reaction that we saw on the still face experiment, where when children feel that we're not here or the setting is not here for them, then they just get frustrated and they just give up. Just the other night, one of my sons came over to me and said he had a hard day. And I said, Mayor, tell me what happened. And I was in the middle of eating supper, and he said, Ta, I want you to listen to me in your office. It's hard to do it to our own children. It's more painful. What when we do, what we when listen to a child, what we want to do is next, shift from content to process. Shift from content means there is the content what the child says, the actual words. But there's a process here. The process is he struggles in reflecting to say, Maishi, you had a rough day today. That's all. That's attending. That's listening. That's seeing the process rather than the content. Reflections are listening to emotions that they express and empathic understanding. Lots of times an empathic response is not more than the following words. I'm so glad you told me. Play the video. in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, 
I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. When we tell a child, you had a hard day, and I'm so it's glad you face. told me. Stop it. You, next slide. That's a moment of an empathic response. Many years ago, I lost a first cousin at a very young age. And he left the Shtib with Yusayimim. And I was there for Shiva when the Shiva of Shadi Yasher, Zichrani Levracha, came to be Menachem Havel. He didn't know this family, but he heard there was a tragedy in Barra Park. And he said, I am part of Barra Park. I want to come visit this family. He walked in, he sat down, and for 10 minutes cried. Stood up, said Amokim Minachem, and left. No one, the children told me, no one was Menachem Avalos like this man. When a child cries and we can just sometimes just show them that we're emotionally with them, that's the greatest attachment and safety we can provide to our children. And it can be difficult to do, especially when we have large families. And it's hard to put everything aside. But at least we want to know that if we have such an opportunity once in a while, it's powerful. The other thing we do in the offices of therapists is, go back to screen, we teach feelings. We help children identify feelings. When Yaakov Avinu when it was in his greatest danger, his brother ran after him to kill him. The first thing it says, Vayida Yaakov Ma'id Vayetzerloi. Yaakov Avinu identified two feelings fear and pain. Research suggests that kids that grow up in a high emotional intelligence have better social skills, better academic skills, reduce behavioral problems. Tie the parents. From a very young age, start talking, feeling language. If you grab, you're sitting at the table with some little kids, and you just grab this little ball that has the six common feelings, and you throw it around. Tell me something about how you felt today that made you sad or angry or happy. Or frustrated. When kids begin to learn feeling language, they can regulate. The very first skill to regulate feelings are language. We ourselves, we adults, use it all the time. We say, I'm just so frustrated. When we say this, we have that awareness. We regulate. Encourage reading books about feelings. Encourage kids to express feelings. And you'll be surprised that even teenagers, when you tell them you're so frustrated and they say, don't validate me, they really appreciate it. Encourage conversations about feelings. And the next thing that we do in the office, which is something we all parents want to help kids, is develop, next slide, is develop coping mechanisms. Coping mechanisms are the way we talk to ourselves when we are in trouble. To come in, log in, and watch it on Zoom, you have to talk to yourself. How am I going to manage this? Are the kids going to be sleeping? What am I going to do with the teens? Who's going to babysit the baby? What happens if a baby cries? You strategize. And as you're watching this, if one of the kids walk in, you again self-talk. Okay, wait a minute. They're talking now about parenting. Let me take a deep breath and let me go out for a minute. 
and tell her, look, give me another half hour, I'll be back. You self-talk. Children and teens don't do that so fast and so natural. What we want to do is teach children to self-talk, catch them self-talk, and compliment them. Ask them, how did you solve this? You must have talked to yourself to say this. That's a powerful skill. At a young age, you can te teach this to children. Of course, you can't do this in the time when they're dysregulated. But start in times when they're regulated. Where do we see self-talk in the Torah? Take a look at the next slide. Vayoymed, when Yaakov was, was, in, was in his most dangerous moment, Vayoymed, he said, If Esav will come to one camp, the other camp will be safe. To whom did he say this? We all know, he said it to himself. Yaakov Avinu spoke to himself. How am I going to manage this most difficult situation? Kids is, I thought about you. Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner, Zechariah Levracha, he was the Rosh Hashiva in the Sifta Chaim Berlin. As a bacher, he arrived to yeshiva and he wasn't matzliach. For six months, he attended yeshiva and he didn't learn. At the end of six months, it was from Pesach to Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, he made the decision that learning is not for me. After Yom Kippur, he's going home and he's, he's going to work. Yom Kippur at Neila. The Alta of Slabatka, his Rosh Hashiva, sent someone to him and said, The Alta will listen dein Mama's Namen. Rosh Hashiva wants to know your mother's name. He said, If my Rosh Hashiva can think about me after not learning for six months by Neila, I am remaining. If children can feel that we think about them, in difficult times, they want to remain connected. When the child came home today, Tuesday, and complained about something that happened, tomorrow, before he leaves to school, or she leaves to school, and you tell him and her, I want you to know that today in the morning, I did two things. I said a kapital to Helen for you. You should have an easier day. And I prepared a little chocolate for you to take along so you remember that I'm thinking about you. When a child complained today about something and tomorrow when it comes home from school, you check in with them, you thought about them. Thinking about children. When they complain to us, the checking in the next day, how powerful that is. Let's talk a little bit about behaviors. How can we foster positive behaviors in children? What is chinuch? There's a Taisus in Mesechtis Nazar that says, Ela la hazidai lasais u lakayim mitzvah. Chinuch means when I encourage my child what to do. When I tell him what not to do, we need to tell children what not to do, and that's not chinach. We still need to say this. But when we want to be machanach, we need to tell them what to do. How do we do this? I was a Rebbe in the classroom for 20 years. And every sukkah, before sukkah, I would go around and ask the boys, tell me, Maishi, tell me, Yaakov, what's your nicest nice sukkah? Bring back the slide. One year, a little tzaddik, al raises his hand and tells me, Rebbe, 
Can I share with you what my father's nicest noise sukkah is? He said, what? He says, every day, my father puts up another ring and a big chain. And on the ring, he writes, something nice we did. And we formed that ring a whole year, that chain. When it comes to sukkahs, we hang that up. And before my father makes kiddush, he says, this is my nicest noise sukkah. When we help children and we show them, I cherish and I am connected to what you do. And I encourage your positive. That's chinuch. There's a famous study done in PCIT, parent-child interaction therapy, which is a modality of treatment for children that are diagnosed with ODD, oppositional defined disorder. These parents, when they walk into my office or into anyone's office, they just say, my child never listens. 10 out of 10, he doesn't listen. We ask them, can we put in a camera in your kitchen? Can we put back your ca a camera in your kitchen? And they say, yeah. And we watch an hour of interaction, what ends up being is that six out of 10, they don't listen, but four, the kids actually comply. But ask a parent, if a child said six times defiantly no, they don't even have kayach to see the next one. Bring up the next slide. You see the, the blue and the red. That's, that's what happens in the setting of every home. What we want to do is we want to be curious and open to catch our children doing things right. How do we do this? What we want to do is look out, stop and pause and look out at you for your child and say, this is something I just noticed. You just are playing, you're playing so nicely. You just mavata her to your sister. You offer her to go first. When I see parents and I ask them, tell me something positive that happened today in your home with the most difficult child you're here for. And usually the answer will be nothing. But I tell them it's safe to explore. Let's start the day. And then suddenly parents will say, you know, I just realized um, we didn't have the bread that he liked, but he was okay with the whole wheat bread. And that's something he doesn't usually do. On the spot, that's a moment to be able to say, you are so strong. You're so powerful. You were able to do that. The Rebbe in a Fabrengen Tavshin Mem Ches said that when a child needs to learn something new, Yomachanachim, the last line is a Hiskarvis or Yeza Matana. You, by reinforcing his behavior with either his carvers, getting closer to him, showing him relationship and appreciation, or sometimes a matana. One of the most powerful things we have in our hands to do is to give a compliment and a detailed praise to a child. Detailed praise is not you are a tzaddik, or you're the best. Detailed means you right away did what I told you. You listened immediately. You um, walked in saying hello. Rabbi Vigda Miller said at the age of 92 that he remembers when he was only 11 years old, bring up the slide, when he was 11 years old, he sat on the steps, the stairs of his house, and a guy passed and told him, ah, do davens da zoi shein. You're davening so beautiful to your God. And what happened is, he says, so many years later, I still remember it. Next slide. Our children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. When we turn to our kids and we look at their eyes and we give them that positive reinforcement, it remains with them.
I'm going to skip a couple of slides, and I want to get to talk a little bit about anxiety. But before I do that, let's go to slide which says Shabbos Lama Dalit. Um, slide number 41. We need to tell our kids things. We need to give direct commands to children. How do we give direct commands? The Gemara says, Shloisha devarim tzorich odem loy mebetoich beisoy erev Shabbos and chashecha. We know the most stressful time in every Yiddish home is Erev Shabbos before Shkia. We need to get everything ready. And that's when the husband, father needs to stand up and say, my dear wife, my dear children, I have two, three points to tell you. One is Isartem, did you give Meiser? Yeraftem, did you make an Erev? And then he has to say, to his wife, Hadliku Esaner, go light the candles. Look at the next slide. Omer Abba Baravina, that's what the Gemara says in Shabbos. Afa al Gav the Omer Abba Nishloish Advarim Tzadok Adam Leimer. Despite the Chachamim said you must say it, I have one thing to tell you. Tzadok Lemeimerinu Benichosa. You need to say this calmly. Ki hechi delekablinu minei. When we want to give commands, we need to speak calmly with the right tone. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with the last um, couple of points. It's important the mental health of your children to help them embrace the changes that they go through. Not going to go through now in details, but parents should talk to their children in an appropriate way, in a tired dig way, all changes. Puberty changes, nisyanis that they go through, the nisyanis of internet, the nisyanis of all the other nisyanis. Parents should have conversations with their kids. At another opportunity, we may be able to talk a lot about it more. I want to get to anxieties in children, just spend three minutes on it because it's the most common mental disorder in children. So if you look at the slide number 52. Anxiety disorders are among the most common mental health conditions affecting children and adolescents in the United States. Anywhere between seven and 31% of children have some sort of anxiety disorder. So that a disorder means that it dysfunctions the person's ability to function academically, socially, behaviorally. These are disorders that are very treatable. Parents can help children with their anxieties. The very first thing is teaching kids to slow down and breathe in. This is a, a technique that we all teach the simplest technique that any therapist would teach a child. Parents can learn to build children. If you look at the research, um, their emotional validation, when children feel validated, they understand that anxiety is normal. When a child says, I'm so afraid for the test tomorrow, and you say, you know what that shows? You really care about the work you do. Imagine if there's a child that just says, I don't care. I'm proud of you. I also want to help you manage that. Open communication. Active listening. Deep breathing. Routines. All these things are helpful. Self-talk. Strategize. Any parent who wants to have the handout of today's work workshop, I'll... I'll email it and you'll be able to forward it because it has the whole list of all these. And finally, there are self-help books for children that can be really helpful. And this book, What to Do When You Worry Too Much, is a simple book for young kids to work through with a parent when they feel anxious. The same author has it on temper, and an OCD, 
These books, if a parent can sit down and do one or two sheets a night, slowly, even integrating it themselves and sharing with the child how they're doing it. And finally, Reb Chaim Kreisvert, Rosh Hashiva in Manchester, Zechreinu Lebracha said, at the Second World War, when he arrived before the war as a bacher, he arrived to yeshiva, And he got a bed immediately in the dorm, despite usually it took six months. One day, a blind boy walks in to yeshiva, and Abchaim goes over to him and says, what are you doing here? He says, I came to see a doctor in this town. Where are you staying? I don't have where to stay. I have a bed for you. Abchaim slept for six months on the floor, and this blind boy slept on his bed. War broke out. The Nazis came in and lined up the Bacharim one by one. Nehergu al Kiddush Hashem. When it came to Chaim, the Nazi Yamach Shemoy told him, Chaim, du bist zu schön. You are too beautiful. And as he's standing there and he says, Rabbi Nishalaylam, I have no schosim because there are greater giants than me that didn't survive. But I have one schos. I gave away my bed to a blind bacher. And this Nazi stares at him and says, I will point away the gun, pretend you're dead, and you'll be safe. If when we give away our physical comfort for someone that's physically blind, HaKadosh Baruch Hu pays us back with life. How much more will HaKadosh Baruch Hu pay us back for providing the support for the children that are blind academically, socially, emotionally. And we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we should be zeicha to be us Mashiach Tzedkeinu v'mehera v'yameinu. Amen. Thank you. I love the bubbles in the summit <laughs> and so many of the other um, practical tips and skills that you taught and to everyone here that's watching online. We've been on a journey tonight. We heard from Mrs. Rabashkin. We heard from Rabbi Spitz. And for our final presenter, um, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, who shares the most emotional, psychological, and spiritual skills to help people live their most meaningful lives. An engaged sage with an open, empathetic, and non-judgmental approach, he provides clarity, solutions, and new perspectives based on timeless teachings. He is the author of the best-selling book, Towards a Meaningful Life, and founding dean of the Meaningful Life Center. We did get some questions in, so after Rabbi Jacobson speaks, I'm going to ask the questions, but if anybody still wants to ask, you can WhatsApp a question to 718 8048955, including if you're watching virtually, we have a lot of people watching virtually, you can WhatsApp a question for Rabbi Jacobson, 718-804-8955. We're lucky, whoever's here and whoever's watching virtually, we know that this recording will live and people watch it and replay it um, so that we could all be gaining. So on that note, Rabbi Jacobson, thank you. And thank you for uh, including me in this uh, critical and vital discussion about the thing that matters most, the thing that defines our lives, our future, our destiny, which is our children, which is why uh, Hashem, God, of all the people that he asked for guarantors, it wasn't the sages, it wasn't the patriarchs or the matriarchs, 
wasn't all the tzaddikim, it wasn't even Moshe Rabbeinu. It was the children, Benenu, Arabim, Badenu. Because if there are no children, there's no future. I remember once speaking to a sociologist. No sociologist. I asked him what is the measure, the criteria for a healthy society. And his response was, well, the usual standard of living, amount of health insurance people have, life expectancy, certain freedoms. And based on those criteria, he says, our society today is uh, the most successful one in history. And he asked me the question of return, which was the point that I wanted to make. So what do you think is the criteria? I said, from a Jewish or Torah point of view, all those things are beautiful blessings, but the criteria is the welfare of our families, of our children. And I remember him looking at me like with, uh, like almost like in shock, and he said, well, if that's the case, we're probably one of the worst generations. Just to show you the contrast of what we, we call success. So, with that in mind, and also listening to the previous speakers, what I'd like to do is put things into, uh, I guess it's always good to look at the root of issues instead of their symptoms. You know, usually any problems that exist, we address the symptoms first. You know, just like a person has a headache, you take a painkiller. If you have a cut, God forbid, you put on a Band-Aid. But the root of issues is always really where all problems begin and where all solutions that are lasting and sustainable are uh, created. And that's often where we err because we don't understand the root, the root of the issue. We usually wake up once we see uh, the, the fire burning. But what caused the fire in the first place? So maybe a good place to just put it into context. I think we have to understand how much we have been programmed and even brainwashed, I would say, by certain social standards. I'll call them secular standards that have infiltrated even the most from world, uh, despite people thinking that they're insulated and protected, but we're not. So as a, an anecdote that's told, I think captures this very well. And that's the anecdote of um, a young girl called Lucy comes home from school and she's been studying biology, the origin of our species. And uh, she's confused, like everybody is, when they start figuring out where do we come from. So she asks her mother, you know, where do we originate from? Her mother gives a warm smile, sits her down, and says, let me share with you. And with Nachas, she begins to share. We had a grandfather that came from Lestetl in Russia, a grandmother from another city in Poland. A few generations before that, we had a great-great-grandfather who compiled and uh, authored a very important work on Jewish law, halacha. And uh, the farther back we go, the better it gets. Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, Sarah Rivka Rachaleya, all the way to Adam Achav and Gan Eden Mikedem, you know, the created by Yitzir Kapov Shalkoz Baruch, who created by God himself. Okay, but then her father comes home from, uh, from work. So Lucy asks her father, same question, where do we come from? So in stark contrast to her mother, he gets all like disturbed and ash, face falls ashen. He sits her down, he says, brace yourself. And he says, well, what science tells us, what we know so far is this, that you go back long enough, we originate from apes. And before that, from amphibians. That's, uh, that's uh, sea animals. And before that, from bacteria. And as far back as they figured, it goes back to billions of years, to a ball of gas. That's where we come from. So pretty different answer. So she goes back to her mother, Lucy does, and says to her mother, I don't understand. You know, you told me one thing, and uh, my father, our father, my father told me something else. Dad told me something else. So her mother smiles and says, we told, both told you the truth. He told you about his side of the family. And I told you about my side of the family. So there you have the, you can call it maybe the reconciliation of what they call uh, creationism and evolution. But it really depends on the side of the family. 
And the Rebbe once said in uh, Abrengen that on Tisha B'Av, when you're not supposed to learn Teda, or at least certain most of Teda, um, so the, the, the children in the, the, with the Malamed had the opportunity to ask questions. And they would talk about the scientific or other developments. So the Rebbe said, he said, I was a little child, I went over to my Malamed. And I asked him, I said, I hear that there are people that believe that we originate from apes. The Rebbe told us in the public fabring. So he says, my Malama told me, he says, What does it bother you if some people think that they come from monkeys? In other words, that's what they think, that's what they think. Maybe that's the basis of this uh, anecdote that I shared. But beyond the, the joke of it, it really um, reveals a cr critical thing that we must understand. And it lies at the heart, really, I believe, of almost every perspective and psychology of how we look at children, how we educate, and so many other implications, how we parent. And it comes down to this, that there is a very different perspective than the Torah perspective on a human being, on a child. Are children born naturally selfish, for example? Are they like um, self-interest, or in the words of Freud, the id drives the human being, which means pleasure, me, 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 or are we created in the divine image? This isn't a small difference, because if we are essentially beasts that have just been trained and we've acquired skills to coexist, so we need red lights and green lights because there's no other way. If everybody drives at the same time in all directions, we won't be able to, to manage. So in other words, we've imposed, again, the quote Freudian thinking, the idea of an ego and superego that regulate the selfishness of the human being. If that's truly who we are, so that sets in motion a whole new way of, of, of how we should educate children. Then education would be fear-based. How do you create enough fear and guilt and shame and judgmentalism to keep the beast at bay? If, however, the essence of the human being is divine, in the words of the Torah, by contrast, they were created with Selim Alekim, the image of God, in the words of Tanya, Chelek Alekam and Malmamish, and even non-Jews are still created with Selim Alekim, Chaviv Adam Shanibra with So it's a whole other story. Then it's a question, education then, is how do you access and allow that divine image to emerge? Very, very different. Now, you can make a very strong argument that people are essentially selfish. All we have to do is look into our own hearts. I mean, I'm sure all of us are guilty at times of doing things that are in our self-interest. I'm not saying we're all going to become axe murderers, but how many times have we heard other people subtly, not so subtly, because of our self-interest? There would be no war in this world. There'd be no abuse. There would be no type, no violations, no violence, no crime if we were not selfish, if we were truly selfless human beings. So history <clears throat> and the evidence is out there. To take it a step further, and I'm not trying to make an argument, I just want to point out how strong this argument can be made, is push comes to shove, there are studies that show, and actual real evidence, that when human beings are put under the test in states of duress, that they'll behave in the most cannibalistic and barbaric fashion. No one should ever be tested when people are tortured or they're dying from hunger or there's an avalanche and there's no food. People will turn and do things that you never would imagine. People, completely normal people that you wouldn't imagine, and I want to say it even, but I have to say it just to drive the point home, will turn to cannibalism even. Because when you're so desperate and hungry, you, you lose your mind. So there are those that argue, okay, yeah, human beings are fine and good when everything is nice. P torture them. God forbid, or put them in the very severe circumstances, they'll turn on each other, even on family members. So that's a strong argument for the, the father of Lucy, you know, that we're essentially beasts. However, we have evolved, so we've developed some form of etiquette, some form of uh, manners and civility. Contrast that to the Taylor view, and the Taylor view is very different. Taylor view, as I said, Selim Alekim, as a matter of fact, the Yetzir Hara is not even mentioned until Pasha Neyach, Yetzir Leva Adam Ramen Urav. 
Yeah, the Nachash in the Gan Eden is already a symbol of the Yetzirah, so it's, uh, instigating us and uh, enticing our Chava and Odom and Chava to eat from the Yetzirah. But the Yetzirah is not mentioned until Pasha Neach. What is the human being? The first time is described, B'Tselem Melekim, B'Tselemenu Kid Musenu. Now, why am I making the point, as I said before, is because you can't imagine how much the secular view, the non tater view, has affected all of us. I don't want to be negative, but go to our yeshiva systems, and even parents. Fear is much easier to use as a tool than love. And where does that come from? It comes from a non-Jewish approach, frankly. I'm not going to state exactly where it does come from. It comes from the view of the concept of original sin, that we human beings are fundamentally evil. Yes, we have a good side to us, but evil is the driving force. Evil means selfish. And therefore, how do you deal with selfishness? If you knew someone was fundamentally selfish, you have to, as I said, what do you do with an animal? You can't talk to a, to a selfish person. You have to find ways to, um, to deter them from acting on their selfishness. So therefore, it's essentially, there's like an undercurrent of a negative attitude even to our very children. Now, it goes against the grain, frankly, of our nature because a parent loves a child. But this attitude ultimately has, effect, has an effect. And that's why it's so vital. And maybe one of the main reasons why Chassidus was revealed in this later generations. Even though in earlier generations, certain things were known uh, viscerally, meaning just by the gut. But then it came a time it had to be articulated. One of the big chidushim of Teireh or Chassidus, that Chassidus reveals to us, reveals, it's not new innovation, is understanding the human being in that way. And I'll give the exact source for it in Tanya. We go to Perikud Beis in Tanya. There's, this is underappreciated even by Chassidim. So the Alter Rebbe says the following. We know that there's a Nefesh Alekis and Nefesh Abamis. Animal soul, divine soul. In every human being, in every child, in every person. And there's a battle. In simple terms, the animal soul, like an animal, is interested in its own survival. Survival of the fittest. The idea that my needs, my needs. The divine soul, the never shall a kiss, is driven by what does Hashem want? Basically a mission-centric life, a purpose-centric life, to serve. Or in, a, in more modern lingo, transcendence, as opposed to survival and your own needs. Comes the Alter Rebbe and says, Base. So how does this battle resolve? How is it resolved? You have your two equal forces. He makes it very clear they're equal voices. So who's going to win? So he says God blessed us with a gift. And it's called Mayach Shalat Alalev. And he even quotes where it is from Zayar Pasha Pinchas. Perikid Beis and Tanya. Mayach Shalat Alalev in simple English means self-control. That the mind has natural control over the heart. But then he adds... Is this control acquired or is it natural? And he says clearly, a person is born inherently with self-control. This is, I don't know what the words use, it's a revolutionary idea. No one had ever said it quite that way till then. Because you could say, look at a child. A young child has self-control. A young child cries when they're hungry, when they're tired, and that's that. You can't speak to a little child. You can't reason with a child when a child's having a tantrum because their survival instinct is to cry out. Everything is driven by impulse, by re reflexes, and so on. It's natural. So you could say, where's the Alter Rebbe say that it's, so, it's natural? When we grow older, chinuch means that we learn, teach the child, say please, say thank you, you share, you show gratitude. These are features, these are values that we teach the child. The child acquires it. It's not Beteva Tel Dose. And yet the Alter Rebbe says clearly, Beteva Yitzhi Dose and Tel Dose. So what's the answer to that? The answer is because the Alter Rebbe is saying we're all born with that. I mean, musical geniuses or musical talents are also not seen when a newborn. But it's still an innate talent inside the child that becomes, that emerges later on in life, maybe in early childhood, whenever. All the qualities and skills of our children don't emerge immediately. You don't always see it. Sometimes it comes later. Meaning comes later, it means emerges later. 
So innately we're born with the power of self-control. Why is this so vital? Because if the Yetzirah and our selfishness is innate and built into us and our self-control is acquired, the rule is a very simple rule. Anything that's acquired is never going to be as powerful as something that's natural. We all know the famous uh, muscle for this, where two philosophers, they say that Rambam and Aristotle or whatever, whoever, however the story is told, were sitting and discussing whether you can train animals to be like humans. And one of them says, I could show you. Yes, yes, you can. And he shows that there was a cat. A cat was trained to walk on two. They dressed the cat in a tuxedo. And the cat is serving uh, is like a waiter in a restaurant in a very elegant way. It brings a tray, brings wine, food to, to all the, the people, at, uh, people eating in the restaurant. Beautiful. You trained the cat to be a waiter. So the other philosopher says, okay, well, see. He, next time they meet, they go to the restaurant, and he brings along a little sack. We didn't know what's in the sack, and please don't shriek when you hear the story here. Um, and he opens up the sack, and suddenly a bunch of mice come running out. And the cat, this elegant cat that seems so sophisticated and aristocratic, suddenly sees the mice. What do you think happened? They dropped the tray, got back on its four legs, and this cat went running after the mice. In other words, yes, you can train a cat for a certain amount of time, but it's not its natural state. So the Altarev is basically saying that if self-control, Mayak Shalatalev, is not natural, it will never be able to beat the natural selfishness of the animal soul. That's why it's muchach, it's critical to state that no, the Tzalem Elikim is an essential part of who we are. And part of that is the Mayak Shalatalev that we're given that's inherent. And as such, the way we look at a human being and the way we look at a child is very different. And this is critical to state, especially today, as I said, because so many different viewpoints are out there. Which means, no matter how bad, and I don't even want to say the worst, but no matter how bad a child may behave, or for that matter, an adult, we have to always know that Selim al never disappears. There's no such thing. Every morning, what do we say? Shachzata bin Nishmasi Maida'ani. Thank you for returning my soul. And then we say, The soul that you've given me is pure. I remember once asking a kanoi, a big zealot, from a certain very Haredish community, who didn't accept anyone Jewish except anyone that looked like him. He was also a rov. And he was like criticizing Chabad's approach to reach out to secular people, to people what he called Bali Aveda, Peshi Yisrael, Goyim, all the different terms used. So I said, I want to just ask you, Shailan Halacha, since you're a Pesach. If a person in your cat you categorize as a Pesach Yisrael, a sinner, and hasn't done any mitzvah, even though it's not possible, there's no such thing as a person hasn't done a mitzvah, but hypothetically, and then one morning, this person decides he wants to daven. And he comes to you and he asks as a rov, should he say, Neshamish and Nesati Bitehiri? His life till that point was not very tired. He didn't live a pure life, a healthy life, a, a holy life, a sacred life. So he looks at me, he says, ah, you're in Yiddish, he says, ah, oh, you know, you're a smart aleph. You know I can't pask in that he shouldn't say it. So I said, so what is he saying, Sheker? Can a person daven and say a lie? Now he never thought of this. This was a big Pesach. Because he, didn't have, he never learned Chesidus. He doesn't understand what a Nisham is. He defines Jews by technical matters. Of course you can't, because the Nisham is Tehidihi no matter who you are. This is not just a philosophical concept. This lies at the heart and essence, I think, of the entire theme of this evening and in general how we deal with our children. Because that means that any negative thing is superimposed. It means it's like the famous example of Friedrich Rebbe, that the letters are engraved in our soul, like the Luchis. But then dust can gather. The Rebbe once wrote in a footnote in a sikha that I prepared. The Rebbe wrote, dust is, is Rosh Hashanah, dust sitra achra. The other side. But it's dust. The great engraved letters, even if they're covered with dust, they don't lose their power. They're just concealed. When you take that attitude, that lies behind all the very fascinating details that we heard from Rabbi Shputz and, and from Mrs. Um, Rabashkin. The 
ultimate, what lies at the heart of it? Why do we have an attitude that's so positive? And why do we have to encourage that? Because what you're dealing with is an neshama. There's a shliach, he says his name already, I'm not going to repeat his name, but he says it publicly, so it's not Loshan Hara. He had a problem, he used to hit his children. He wrote to the Rebbe, he says he can't control himself. There are times the children behave in ways and he just hits them physically. And the Rebbe's response to him, as he shares, was, this is not your child. It's Hashem's child. What right do you have to touch a child that's not your own, and let alone a child of Hashem? I hope it helped, but it's a fascinating uh, point if you think about it. It's true. Our children don't belong to us. Hashem sent a gift. They're three partners. It's true. Without the parents, a child wouldn't be born. But the neshama of the child, and in general, the child belongs to, the, to uh, Hashem, which is, by the way, why Kabe de I don't know if you ever thought of it. Kibud Ava'im is not considered a mitzvah ben Adam l'chavere. That's why it's one of the fifth of the of a sedes It belongs in the first luach, the first of the tablets, together with anoichi Hashem alekecha, and all the mitzvahs between us and Hashem. Why? Because honoring your parents is honoring God's life, your life, the life that God gave to you through your parents. Which is why, when your parents tell you to do something that goes against what Hashem says, you're not supposed to listen, because they're not they're not in control. They don't own. They're they are blessed, but the opportunity to cultivate and to nurture a neshama of Hashem. If we knew that in our hearts, and that's what we convey to our children, I don't even have a doubt that, that would be the best preventive and preemptive measure to so many of the maladies that children are dealing with. Obviously, there's no magic tricks, but it ultimately comes down to understanding of that. And that's why understanding Chassidish and what Chassidish says about a neshama and the Malikim is critical. Because it ultimately comes down to that is your child. Your child is God's gift. And you're also God's gift. As children, however, that are defenseless and vulnerable and impressionable, so it's even more acute the responsibility we have because everything we do is going to impact them. I remember once speaking to someone who went through a very difficult childhood, terrible parents, dysfunctional parents, I should say, terrible childhood, I would say. I'm saying, no, they don't, that's terrible, but it was not good. And education, school, a lot of problems. And I remember he was crying to me, he said to me, why would God do this? Why would God take a pure soul? You tell me I have a pure soul. I accept that. But why would God put a pure soul into such a home? Such a family that defiled and abused. It's like, the best example maybe is that every one of us, every neshama is like a flower. Parents are supposed to be gardeners, and instead of gardening and nurturing and watering and cultivating the flower, they poison it. They pollute it. Why would God do that? I didn't have an answer, and I still don't have an answer. I mean, the only answer is Hashem, that's part of free will. He gave us a great gift, an opportunity as parents, but he also, every great gift also comes with great responsibility. And unfortunately, many parents, they themselves were hurt as children, very often we'll repeat what happened to them. But that doesn't mean we don't have free will. And I know, even though I'm talking about parents here, this equally applies to uh, schools. You're talking about nefoshes, God's souls. That's not just a cliche, it's not a bumper sticker. It's essentially how we look at a human being. The truth is that all human beings, but especially our own children. I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent today. To say that I always 24-7, listen, we're all human beings. I'm not saying we won't, we won't at times fail and at times not live up to our, the, the greatest potential, but we have to know that's the standard. I remember a few years ago, it was right before Rosh Hashanah, so I received a, uh, an email from one of my students. A second, when I, when I met her, she, was, uh, she didn't even see it, and she, her life was this. Till nine years old, she didn't know she was Jewish. Her parents were so assimilated, they didn't want, they changed their name. They didn't want her to know. I wanted to bring her up like a non-Jew. It was a, in a country in Europe. She came from a very wealthy family. But something in her always knew there was something going on. She would go Yom Kippur to Shul, to Shul, without her parents' knowledge, even as a young child. Then one day she overheard them speaking and she realized that she's Jewish. 
They were talking about some legal matters, and they, you know, they were changing documents, who, you know, where they came from. Anyway, long story short, this woman slowly began to explore her Judaism and became a shame of her mitzvah, so she lives today in Israel. But as she put it, I grew up in a, in a home where I had everything. Material, I had everything. But it was a gilded cage. Because my soul and my, my mother didn't even look at me. I had nannies after nannies, but I did not have love for my parents. And then she sent me right before a Shoshana that year, a few years ago, a picture of herself as a little girl. You know, baby, almost like a baby picture. And with one line, she says, what happened to this girl? You know, everything that she had gone through in life. Remember, it was like a, quite a riveting question. What happened to this girl? You know, we're all born pure, like pure snow, freshly fallen snow. Salam alikim, tehedehi. And then things happen. Even in the best case, case scenario, children will go through their challenges, hopefully a minimal amount. But everyone's going to go through some challenges. And she asked me, what happened to this girl? And I, w I really wanted to have an answer for her. I mean, of course, what happened was that she went through a lot of pain. And the answer, of course, is now you can come back and reconnect to Hashem, reconnect to your Salam Alekim. Obviously, but I wasn't just going to give her a pat answer. So everything is Ashgacha Pratis. A few days later, also before Rosh Hashanah, I get another email from a, a, a mother. She says, I, li see, I listen to your classes, I listen to your programs, talk a lot about children, parents. What do you suggest something for Rosh Hashanah, Hachlata, that every a parent should take upon themselves? Something new that we haven't done. I'd like to hear your suggestion. And then suddenly these two stories came together. The story, the picture of a child. So I wrote up a suggestion. I sent it to this woman, and I'll tell you what happened afterwards. I wrote up something like this. I said, you know, we all love our children. And I'm sure every day in the morning when they wake up and when they go to sleep, you say, I love you. I mean, that's the lines that most of us say. But maybe in addition to that, here's the suggestion for Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the collective birthday of the human race. It's the day when the Tzalem Alikim was created. That's why it's Rosh Hashanah, the birth of, the human, of Adam and Chava. So perhaps Achlata would be like this, that in addition to lo you love your children, taking care of them, doing everything that they need, also make it a, a point that every morning when you say Maida'ani with them, and every evening before they go to sleep, you say, Biyat Chav Kedruchi with them, to also add and explain. I said, what are we saying when you say Maida'ani or Biyat Chav Kedruchi? We're saying that you are an Hashem that God chose, sent to this world, a unique soul, a piece of Hashem in some way. Hashem is giving you a renewed vo vote of confidence every morning when you wake up, renewing your contract, so to speak. You have something unique to contribute to this world that no one but you can contribute. And that's the mission of your life. Everything else is commentary. Everything else is to fulfill why Hashem chose you. And I, as your parent, I'm here to do whatever it takes to help you actualize your skills, your talents, your potential, that your neshama can shine, and glow, spread your wings, and be the best you can be, and, and impact your environment and everything you'll ever do in your life. So that's what I suggest. So, and if helpful, why don't you also look, take a picture out of yourself as a child, because that's what you are as a child, that pure soul. And whatever happens later in life, is a distraction, sometimes it's a strong distraction, but never lose sight of the fact that Hashem put you here from the moment that you were conceived, from the moment you were born. So I wrote this up, one of my articles, right before Rosh Hashanah, and I, you know, this woman thanked me, but you should see what happened. Over the year, especially coming to the next year, I can't tell you, maybe hundreds, I got hundreds of emails of parents who said they read that and they did it, and actually change the entire environment in their home. Because children, you know, early on, okay, they don't really know what it means exactly, neshama, purpose, mission. But as you keep saying something like that every day, it becomes a topic. So I said, our children started asking us, what does that mean, a mission? What does it mean, a neshama? And it became a conversation at the breakfast table, and at dinner, and Shabbos. It created a whole climate 
of, com of conversation around this topic because it's very intriguing. That I have a mission, that I'm unique, that I have something. Now, I know all of us know this in our hearts, but sometimes you have to spell it out. I mentioned before, there's a reason Chassidus came to the world was to spell out things that once perhaps we picked up just from the smell of the chicken soup in our grandmother's kitchens in the old shtetl. But today it has to be spelled out because we have full many forces out there. All the technology and all the media and everything that is inundating ourselves and our children all have the opposite message. They're not teaching us that we are unique and indispensable and Hashem put you here for a mission. They're teaching you how to take care of your needs and how to satisfy our pleasure and how to uh, have instant gratification. So we're not in a neutral world, as the Rebbe would often quote the Friedrich Rebbe, life is like on a mountain. You're either going up or you're going down. You're either being influenced or you're going to be an influencer. There's no such thing as, as an, a neutral position because we live in a world that is actively marketing to us and constantly inundating us with all kinds of messages. You know, the guy, they asked him, he says, I used to think I'm indecisive, now I'm not so sure. That's also a position, to be indecisive. So we have really two options, either to be on the defense or to be on the offense. And when you're armed with the fact that that there's a fundamental that's the essence of every Jew, and every human being is created with Salam Alekim, that's already, we don't, we don't begin um, at first base. It means we begin our lives with a vote of confidence that Hashem blessed us and put our Hashem into this world and said, you have something unique and I'm sending you as my ambassador and my messenger, my shliach, to change your corner of the world in some way. Again, I have no doubt that this type of message if it was repeated again and again to every child on this earth, would be the greatest preventive and preemptive measure to avoid so many problems that come later. As some thinkers say, it's far easier to bring up a healthy child than to fix a broken adult. I, mean, I deal mostly with adults. And I can tell you, the hours, the money, the time, the, the energy that is spent in fighting demons and fighting addictions, and fighting all the darkness, and fears, and insecurities, is just staggering, it's mind-blowing. And as a child been given the tools, and recognized I have something unique, and I was sent on a mission, and the Shama and Sat to be Tahiri, again, I'm not saying that guarantee, it guarantees in the sense, there's always life, it's called Hadrachim Becheskes Arkon, life is filled with challenges, but you're armed at least. What's the first line in Tanya? Tanya b'seif perigimol the nidah. What does it say? Mash bi'an esat hi tzadik val tirosh. First line, the Gemara, and the Tzemach Tzedek and the Rebbe elaborates what means mash bi'an. Mash bi'an comes from the word shvur, that an oath that we take an oath that will be a tzadik, not a rosh. But it also comes from the word v'savata, v'chalta v'savata. It also comes we're sated, we are we're downloaded with all the energy and with all the sustenance needed to be a tzadik and not a rosh. Why? Because we're given mayach shalat ala lev, we're given an neshama that's tahirihi, we're given all those tools. The Gemara that says that every child in its mother's womb is taught the entire Torah. The entire Torah is taught in the mother's womb. You know, I always say that's like the best school you'll ever have. After that, it's always going to be downhill. No one can teach as well as a malach can teach in the mother's womb. Uh, with all respect to all the teachers in all the schools. But that's what we're given. And the Altar Rebbe asks, so then why are we made to forget? Upon birth, we know the angel comes and that's why we have a cleft on our uh, upper lip. We're made to forget. So the Altar Rebbe explains, consciously we're made to forget. But superconsciously, unconsciously, we carry in our very DNA nine months of everything we will need to deal with every challenge in life. So Tate is not being taught to us, it's being retaught to us. So we're actually discovering resonating truths. You know, they know there are studies today that show that children in pregnancy, um, fetuses, the, the respond to song. You play a song and children, a baby in its mother's womb at a certain stage will respond to song. And nobody understands why. Even language is quite a mystery that a child learns language within two, three years. 
But how does the child know song? No one ever never heard a song before. So Chassidus answers, because the neshama is taught everything in song. That's the language of a neshama, is song. So song is the natural language. We don't come unprepared in this world. That's why the gunim and songs so resonate. You don't need to be trained to hear a song. To know language and to understand vocabulary, you need to be trained. But song's just natural. Because a neshama is song, Torah is song, zmires. And it's all about that resonating truth that is, exists within us. So the amount of resources we have are far more than you can ever imagine. I can tell you without question. You know, I sometimes sit and I mean, we all love our children, we love our grandchildren. You know, that's natural. But I sometimes spend hours watching my grandchildren, especially the youngest ones. Because I look at them and I see this is the closest thing to what Hashem created. You know, in technology they say, you know, like an I, I, iPhone 10 is better than iPhone 9. 9 is better than 8. I think with children and lives, it's the other way around. The younger they are, the closer they are to where Hashem wanted them to be. And then they get somewhat, I guess, uh, just like uh, our lungs and other parts of our body begin to develop toxins and pollutants. And I look at the child and I say, this is what Hashem created. And everything about the child, the adventurous nature, the free abandon, the exploration, which is no surprise, as uh, Rabbi Shputz mentioned, the powerful idea of when you, a child looks at something, you look at a child and the child looks back. This is not because the child is not prepared. The child is given everything it needs. And frankly, as many parents sometimes come to me and they want a blessing for their child, I said, my blessing is you should get out of the way and let the child be as godly as God wants them. But it's also our job to be the gardeners because a garden does need to be watered and it does need to be weeded to make sure that the flowers emerge. But the flowers will emerge because that's what God created. Our job is to make sure the environment is pure. And this, I believe, is the backdrop and the fundamental context of everything. We teach ourselves this. We teach our children this. That is the basis for everything else. Because then when you look at your child and you see it's a God-given God gift, then of course you'll listen to your child. Of course you won't be sitting on your smartphone or texting. You're talking to, it's like talking to a piece of Hashem. And it was given to you to watch over. Now again, it's not about us being perfect. It's a standard that we have to work toward. And how many other things would be so critical when we understand when we, what we're dealing with there? And you saw that. Anyone that saw the Rebbe with children, the Rebbe was once asked, why is he so happy when he smiles when he sees children. And you don't see necessarily all those smiles when he sees adults. And the Rebbe said, because kinders and atrop nante tzememes. Children are one drop closer to emes. Because we live in the alma de shikr, in a false world, and a corrupt world, and a, a duplicitous world. And children don't have duplicity. They learn duplicity, frankly, and they learn how to lie, you know, from whom? From us. They learn from their parents, and from adults. So, v'heshev lev avas al bonim that the parent, the heart of the parents will come to the children. Obviously, children are not the armechanchim as adults, but they can teach us something much more than we teach them. And that is the pure neshama, what a child is. If we were able to appreciate that, and we have lived in a society, frankly, as I began, that does not appreciate it. Children are not number one priority. Careers, money, pleasures, even beautiful people get very distracted. But no surprise, that's what this material world is like. People also ignore God. So of course they're going to ignore God's uh, gifts, including our children. But that's our job, is to counter that trend and that uh, so-called conventional way of thinking and understand that this is the single most important thing. The Torah does not begin by saying the human being is an intelligent creature, an emotional creature, a person who can make money, is that the B'Tselem Elikim, you're a piece of godliness. God put a child in this earth, and every one of us is that child to, to express and reveal the godliness within us, within everyone around us, and within the world around us. Which is why we say when Mashiach comes, and the Rebbe, remember when the Rebbe started very strongly when he established Sivas Hashem, Tov Shemem, Mem Aleph, he made it very clear, he brought that Pasuk, Beheshu Levovas Albonim, which is a nevuah in Malachi, it's in the, that the children 
will return the hearts of their parents. The children will be prophets when Mashiach comes. Kulam yedu esi Because it's the child spirit that naturally is so close to godliness. And it's true, adults obviously, we are far more developed and more seasoned and more experienced. But the tmimus and the pshitus, when you look in the Maimorim of Chassidus and Tereir, the Baal Shem Tov, the simplicity of the child touches the simplicity of God. Nothing comes close to that because it's not jaded and not affected by the, all the pollutants of existence, including our minds and our hearts and so on. So may we rise to the occasion and demonstrate that our children are the single most precious treasure, and that's the future and the present. And our job is to make sure that it's passed on, and passed on in the fullest sense of the word. And there was no surprise that in the last sikhs of the Rebbe before, unfortunately, the Rebbe had a stroke, so much emphasis on children. I remember Simchas Teda, Tavshin Mem, Tavshin Nun Beis. The Rebbe spoke about the children, Al Tigri the Rebbe said which is an expression, a posuk, but also a maimer chazal, don't touch the children because they're called Mashiach. That's why everyone has to go build the Beis HaMikdash Shlishi except the children because they are the Beis HaMikdash Shlishi. They are Mashiach. They are the, the, the anointed ones. Remember, which means not just not to touch them. It means to bring to them, allow them to flourish and, and thrive. And they are the key to bringing the Geula Mitis Vashlem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobson. Okay, so a bunch of questions came in, but it's also late. So I'm wondering if I could just bombard you with all of them and you kind of answer it at once. You think that could work? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to read it all. Late for whom, by the way? Late for whom? I don't know, the clock? <laughs> if you have all night, then we're good. Um, okay, so I'll read the questions, and then if you could just answer it. Um, what can you do if your child, you see that they need help, emotional or mental support, and they refuse to get help? Uh, will it be too hard to remember, or it's okay for me to go through and read the, all the you questions? Can, read them all now. can I see them? Yeah, yeah, I'll read them. They're right here. Another one is. So what's that? Do you want me? To, do you want to read them all? Then I'll answer. Or yeah, that's what I'm thinking. What? Because if I um, ask a bunch of questions, you might be able to consolidate it into okay. one answer so and save us time. Okay. Part. What can you do if your child refuses to get help? The child refuses. The child refuses to get help. Another mother asked, "How can you? What are some ways to get your child to open up to you of what's going on in their emotional?" and mental world. Uh, they're not necessarily related. Another question that came in was, um, did the Rebbe ever give guidance on when spiritual guidance is enough for emotional mental health and when you should turn to a professional? Another question that's related to that is, if you go for help, how do you know if there's a perspective that's in line with Tyre and Chassidus or not? So I would put that into two categories. The first one is how do you get your child to open up more and know what's going on, and if they refuse to get help, how could you help them? The second thing has to do with more of this perspective on um, when, you know, when you should go for professional help and how you know that it's in line with Tyra. So I'm leaving this here, but those are some of the questions that came in. And then you wanted to... There were more, but those were the... Okay, the highlight one. Okay, good. Okay, so... Um... I'll just go in order of the questions. Um, look, when you say a child doesn't want help, you have to also establish, firstly, what age the child is. You know, very young, obviously, you don't have to ask the child much. You do what you have to do as a parent. So I'm assuming this question is based on a child that has, is old enough to uh, resist and say, I don't want help, and that's that. Um, so I go back and I'll quote some of what uh, the previous spoke, speaker spoke about and just add a little more to it. At the end of the day, um, anyone that's resisting help, that itself is part of the problem, either because they feel that they're being looked at as a problem. So you have to, I remember this, a couple came to the Rebbe by Mach Nisrael, and they said, we have a child that is acting out at home and what should we do about the child? And the Rebbe started asking questions. How's the child at school? Does he have friends? Yeah, and the answer was yes, friends, and so on. And the Rebbe said, leave the child alone, and the child will be fine. In other words, the parents were making a bigger problem than there was. Because they, you know, had, this, had they said that the child is also acting out of school, is isolating himself, or doesn't have friends, so maybe there's something more going on. 
But in other words, in certain environments, so the Rebbe recognized quickly that the parents are becoming too panicky. And, it's, and the children don't want to be looked at as a, they're a problem. So it's, it's more than just, okay, a child doesn't want to go for help. The question is how it's been presented. So it's critical that it be presented in a loving way. And this, again, would require to know the details because we're talking about what's the situation. If the child is behaving in real, really terrible ways and you must do something, then obviously you take much more aggressive measures. If the child is acting out and it's not so what? So here, that leads me to the other question about getting advice. As parents, as much as we love our children, we're also subjective, which means we may underreact or overreact. You know, some parents always blame their children. Some parents never blame their children. Obviously, but it has to be something in between. So having a mashpia, a rov, a chaver, someone, a mentor that you can ask is vital. And look, this is the hira from the Rebbe, a direct hira, a sele harav, everyone must have, especially when it comes to situations where we may be somewhat biased. And that should be a chsidish, a person who understands teira and chsidish. If they have some professional side to them, ma manoim, even better. And that, I go to the other question, will help also determine. It's not always easy to establish should you just get chsidish advice from a mashpia or do you actually need medical or professional support because there are clinical issues, there are things that are outside the realm. We know, remember, Nitin Rishus Rapis. So Teda clearly condones and Teda suggests and, and says go to a doctor. Question is, where do you go to a doctor where you don't? So we all know when it comes to a, a root canal or anything that's clinical or physical, everyone understands Mashpia is not going to be able to help you there. But then there are borderline issues, emotional issues, psychological issues, and that's where if you have a good mashpia, they'll say, I think this is really an area we should get a professional opinion. So the professional opinion can be from someone that may not even be a shemitah or mitzvah, if they're competent. But if you have a mashpia who knows that, well, they'll please say, you know, you look for the most competent person. And it's case by case. There's no real, there's no thumb of, uh, there's no rule of thumb that says this is the way to do it. Because there are areas, you know, maybe the child has some depression. Is it something just to talk to the child or maybe the child needs some medication? And I'm not advocating medication. I'm not doing that. But you need to really rule out all possibilities. You don't want to leave, uh, you don't want to leave any stone un uh, unturned because it's your child. So I think having an objective mashpia that understands teda, yiddishkeit, chassidus, and so on, that can help you make that decision. And that also is regarding how much do you do? What do you do when a child doesn't want? It depends. I know situations where you ask a professional, a professional says, based on what you're saying, we got to get the child in here. It's, it's dangerous. You know, or sometimes let the child be and uh, let's watch. We'll monitor it. That's why it's not such a black and white. As far as the other two questions, did the Rebbe ever give guidance on what spirit um, and when to go turn? Okay, I answered that question. Um, what was the... Right, how to get the child to open up, right. I think Rabbi Shputz, or Dr. Shputz, or whatever it was called, what was he called, Rabbi? Well, said it very, very well. To, you can't, I mentioned before, a flower. You can't force a flower to come out of the ground. You know, as much as you pull it, it's not going to grow that way. You need to water it. I find that children will open up if you show them love. That doesn't mean automatic, but it's definitely not going to work with uh, aggression. Like if you start telling your child, what's the matter? You've got to tell me, what's the problem? What's the problem? And if you make a whole emergency meeting with you and your husband or, or you and your wife, and you start saying, and you're like, you corner the child, these things usually don't work because that just drives fear in the child. I remember by myself as a child. When something happened, I did something, I made some trouble, and my parents turned it into a whole federal case. It wasn't really helpful. So it's critical to, to come with a very positive attitude. You have to create trust, because at the end of the day, why would someone open up to you? Why would they not? Trust. Or they're afraid. They're afraid if they say something, who knows what you're going to do. I remember one of my children gave her a laptop in school, and then someone stole it. And she was so terrified to tell me, because she thought, who knows how angry I would get. And it was not the case at all. I wasn't angry at all. It happens. So. Children will withhold things because they either have fear or they, um, they don't feel the trust. So again, there's no magic cures, but often don't do what you instinctively want to do. Like 
confront the child. Children don't respond well to confrontation. They'll often avoid it or even lie. You want them to have a relationship. I will also say, as we all know, problems, the, the relationship with your child does not begin when there's a problem. It begins before that. If there's trust before it, more likely they'll talk to you. If the only time you talk to them is when trouble comes up, you can imagine the child's not going to open up so easily. So I think it's all preparing the ground. A child that feels a parent that talks to the child, even when things are peaceful and going well, far more likely when there's a problem, the child will open up. Again, no guarantees, and that's why it's important to have, as I said, an objective mentor. I think I covered that first category of questions. Okay, I'll say it into the mic. Um, all these concepts that are, you know, beautiful and helpful and neshama, et cetera, but how do you say that in children language? How do you bring it down to a kid in a way that's really going to... We, we turned and deferred to you to write another book like that. Um, okay, I'll put it in my words. Uh, I think uh, every language, every child has its language and every child responds in different ways. Uh, I would look to find something that is um, specifically that your child is good at. You know, some children are very creative. Some children are uh, very intuitive. Some children are very uh, cerebral. I mean, there's all kinds of different uh, talents. Find something that your child gravitates to on, on their own and empower them, like incentivize them, encourage them, do it with them. A, a tr a, because by doing that, you're essentially saying what I said earlier in more, uh, I guess, academic terms. You're saying, look how special you are. You have something unique, and let's do whatever it takes. You know, when you see parents, for example, give children music lessons or things like that, besides helping them cultivate a talent, you're also, it's a vote of confidence. It's saying, you're good at this, and I want to help you become even better. I'm not talking about parents imposing something they want that the child doesn't like. So I think in the language of children, it sometimes comes down to finding the thing that children gravitate to and really dr driving that home and saying, saying when you say Moedani in the morning, you're in the summer, you know what you like to do today? You come home from school today, we're going to go to the park because you love to uh, look at different birds. I don't know. I just threw something out like that. Connected to the neshama because your neshama has that uh, inclination. Remember, we don't always know what a neshama is like. You see it by the with things that are attracted. You know, I have a grandchild that loves to look at encyclopedias, knows every animal on earth. So whenever I speak to him, I'm always asking him about this animal, that animal, you know, and, it's, and I always say, these are God creatures. It's very interesting that you like really want to know every creature that God put on earth. So you try to connect something that they're doing that you see they already gravitate to and try to put it in a language. And these are also planting seeds. As they get older, they'll start appreciating and understanding that the things that they're good at are part of what their mission is. Um, and again, different, don't underestimate children, you know, Children yeah, say to them, what is a neshama? I, I like to ask children sometimes, what do you think a neshama looks like? And you find very interesting answers that they get, you get from children. So I would just look to cultivate. Remember another thing, children are naturally spiritual and naturally creative. And very much our academic teachings, our schools, knock that out. We teach them to be much more mechanical, much more fact-driven, fact data-driven. We have to cultivate imagination of children. Like, you know, they that uh, joke they tell, a teacher gave an assignment to the children to draw something, whatever they want to draw. And the children drew, one little girl was drawing and drawing, and the teacher says, what are you trying to draw? God. She says, you know, God? What does God look like? She says, wait, you'll soon see. In other words, the child was trying to figure out what God looks like. These things have to be cultivated because you never know what children... Instead of like uh, dismissing it and saying, "Become the children are not adults in the making," they cultivate that sense of dreaming, uh, imagination, even fantasy, is part of what a, a, a fertile mind is like. And I think when we do that, you'd be surprised at what we can learn from our children. Okay, that was so practical. I love how all your answers really go back to the title of your book, the title of the organization, Towards a Meaningful Life. Everything is about finding the meaning, finding the mission, and it all revolves around that. So that was very uplifting. Thank you so much, Robert Jacobson. And thank you, everyone, who joined us tonight um, for this very important evening for the mothers. Thank you for making this happen. And may this have a poem shachas. Perpetual effect, and uh, it's all recorded, right? So people can access it. If anybody wants to ask further questions, you know, I'm accessible. I do every Sunday night, my life is supplied. You can submit questions that are follow up to this, and I'll be happy to address them. So 
we have a Hemshech continuation. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay.